Well, good morning to you all. It's, it's good to, to, to be with you and to want to welcome those who are watching online. Um, I'm excited. I'm just so excited about what I want to share this morning because this can be a life-changing message. And I've been praying that it would do that very thing. Dennis and I are are in a series called Discipleship Redefined, and you might say, well, why do you need to redefine discipleship? And our answer would be that through the centuries, through church history, discipleship has morphed uh, and morphed and morphed into something that I don't think Jesus meant when when he originally talked about becoming disciples. We've relegated discipleship to programs and to, um, you know, things that that don't really produce disciples. And so, um, Dennis and I were kind of like, well, what does produce discipleship? And we've um, we've we've kind of realized that as God pours into us, uh, then discipleship is is taking what He's poured into us. And making a choice then to pour out to other people. Uh, to to uh, Our definition of discipleship is this. It's a call to servanthood to Christ. And it's a personal voluntary devotion to follow Jesus as Lord and Master say, and teacher, you know, wholeheartedly. And, you know, discipleship is a choice. It's, you know, Jesus said, if you would be my disciple, you would... Choose to deny yourself, take up my cross, or take up your cross, which is denying our own wills, our own agendas, our own um, uh, kingdoms, and and choosing to make His agenda, His will, and His kingdom our primary purpose for living. And it's a choice that we make. And one of the things that we've said over and over again is that we don't want to confuse salvation, which is a free gift. Of grace through faith in Christ. It's what he's accomplished for us. When he said it is finished, that was sealed. Our salvation is sealed. And when we put our faith in Christ, we receive salvation. And we don't earn salvation or keep salvation by being a disciple. But if we want to live a life that's rewarding and fulfilling and joyful and those kinds of things, then we move from from being... um, simply saved and and having salvation to following Jesus with all our hearts. It's, you know, that's what our goal for this series is to kind of show us what that means and how to get there. And so the first thing that we need to do is to, uh, and by the way, if we, if we don't differentiate between discipleship and salvation, then, and we conflate the two, we combine the two and we feel like that, okay, we, we receive salvation by grace through faith, but then we keep our salvation by being a disciple and denying ourselves and fighting, you know, then, then it, we get on this performance thing, this rat wheel, and we're trying to please God and earn our keep, so to speak. And so we, we just want to make sure that these two remain separated, but one should lead to the other if, if we're in a healthy relationship with Christ. And so, um, what we're basically doing two parts of this series on discipleship redefined. We're talking about the pouring in into us that we receive from from God through Christ and the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about God's purpose for us is to be his children. That's why we were created, to be children of God. And we've talked about the incarnation where because of the fall, because we, the human race, ended up uh, rebelling against God and moving away from God and separating ourselves from God, becoming spiritually dead, God the Son came here as our mediator and brought the human race and God back together in himself. He wrapped himself in our brokenness, in our wrongness, in our alienation, in our separation, in all that was wrong with us. And he took all of that and us to the cross and destroyed that there. And we died with him on the cross. And then in his resurrection, we were resurrected with him. And we, when we put our faith in him, we are resurrected with him to live a new life in the spirit. 
talked about redemption, which is exactly what I described just now. And the last two Sundays, Dennis has talked about what it means that when we come to Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, and it, he's God in us, speaking to us. And so all those things we've talked about this morning. Uh, so the first part is of the series is about what's been poured into us through grace and faith and, and uh, receiving through faith what, what God has done for us in Christ and with us in Christ and to us in Christ. The second half is going to be about pouring out. So we've been poured into, then as a disciple, we get to pour out those things to other people. And so we're going to, in, in, after our missionary couple speaks to us on the 25th, then we're going to go into the second half of this series, and we're excited about that. The title of what I want to talk about this morning is Our Union with Christ. And so the title of my message this morning is Living in Union with Christ. And guys, I'm so excited about this because I'm really beginning to see clearly that Paul's gospel that we've proclaimed to be the gospel of grace is really the gospel of grace and union with Christ. It's both. It's, yes, grace is awesome. We receive all of the goodness of God, all the the benefits of, of being in relationship with God through Christ. We receive forgiveness and redemption and all those things. But the thing that 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 the American church has missed is the fact that, that Jesus didn't just go up in heaven with the Father and then, you know, gave us the, the Sermon on the Mount and a good example, and then we're down here to try to live that out while he's up there, you know, sending help from, from the, the, the right hand of the Father. That's not Christianity, the way it's meant to be lived. And so today, I just intend to teach us, inform us, inform you about the joyful gift of union with Christ, because this is a huge piece of the gospel, our union with Christ. The first thing that I want to do, though, is just present the problem that we we face as, as Western Christians, as American Christians, as Christians that either grew up in the church or have come into contact and connection with the church and have basically been given a truncated half gospel. And so we've been taught uh, mostly that Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven when we die. Well, that's wonderful. That's true. We, Jesus did die for our sins, and we do get to go to heaven when we die. But if that's all we got, that's not enough to live this Christian life. If the truth sets us free, which Jesus proclaimed in John 8, our problem is that we've only got half the truth or not even maybe that much in in this truncated gospel. One of my seminary professors used to say, one of my heroes, we've only got enough religion to make us miserable, most of us. And what he was saying there is we only understand enough truth about what Christ has done for us, with us, and to us, that, that we, we, we have just enough of that to get saved, but not enough to live in joy and peace and fruitfulness. And we end up living a very um, joyless, fruitless, striving, straining kind of life, hoping that somehow we might please God and burning out in the process. I would say that, that yeah, we, we've got just enough truth to make us miserable and not enough truth to set us free. If the truth sets us free, then why aren't we free? <laughs> Dennis and I want you to know the truth of the gospel, the full gospel, the complete gospel, so that you can live a life of joy and peace and fruitfulness and all the things that God intended. But with only half the truth, we have a problem. How were you taught, think about this, how were you taught in Sunday school, in church, wherever you connected with the church, how were you taught to live the Christian life? Were you taught to put on your WWJD bracelets, what would Jesus do, and try to do what Jesus would do? Were you taught 
that the Sermon on the Mount is the way to live. When Jesus said, if, you know, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man that built his hand, house upon the rock. Well, I don't want to build my house upon the sand, so I'm going to strap on the, the Sermon on the Mount and try to live, live that out. And I mean, I lived many years like that. Jesus was serious about that, but the problem was that what he was doing in the Sermon on the Mount, he was talking to the Jewish people, and a lot of the Pharisees were listening to that. He said, guys, you, you've heard it said that you've got to clear the high jump bar. What's actually true is you've got to clear the pole vault bar, and I'm not going to give you a pole. So you're, you're thinking that if you don't commit adultery, you're, you're clearing the bar. But I say, even if you look on someone lustfully, you're committing adultery in your heart. You've heard it said, if you do not murder, I say, if you are angry and hateful in your heart towards people, you've committed murder in your heart. He just took the bar and raised it out of reach. And so does he intend us to do that now? I mean, that's what we've been taught, many of us. And you die trying, right? How many of you grew up listening to, when I, was, when I was in college, I remember for the first time seeing this bumper sticker, and then it was everywhere, Jesus is my co-pilot. You ever seen that sticker? Jesus is my co-pilot. What does that infer? You're flying the plane. Good luck with that. I don't fly very well. If Jesus is my co-pilot and he doesn't have some control, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'll tell you that. How about this? The, the poem that the, I saw this poem everywhere. Plaques going to a Christian bookstore. There's 15 different versions. I mean, like renditions of it on towels and, and, and blankets and, you know, little ceramic, you know, footprints in the sand. Two, foot, two sets of footprints. And I just sprayed. Sorry. Uh, let us spray. Yeah. I feel sorry for you guys on the front row. You might want to bring an umbrella, you know, next time. I just saw this spittle just go out here and I said, sorry. You know, I have to point out what's obvious. Sorry. Um, I think you're safe. I think you're far enough. Uh, but um, footprints in the sand, you know, this, the, the, the poem, I'm not going to quote it, but it says, I, I saw these two sets of footprints in the sand and then I saw one set. And I was like, Lord, why did you leave me? And then I found out that Jesus was carrying me some of the time. The rest of the time, I'm walking it out with him, you know, helping me beside me or whatever. But there, there were times that life got so difficult, he had to carry me. Well, <laughs> uh, that's not biblical. I'm sorry to tell you, that's not biblical. Um, Jesus has to do this. And we just rest while he does, well, but anyway, I'll get to that. The sad lie, the sad lie is that Jesus died for us. Now, you've heard this too. Jesus died for you. The least you can do is live for him, witness for him, work for him. You know, so get busy. Daggone it, why are you just sitting around? Get busy. Um, Jesus died for you, and he was, was, um, was raised, he returned to heaven, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, he's up there watching you, he told you what to do, now get, get busy doing it, live like Jesus. And he's praying for you, and sometimes he actually sends you help. But you figure out what you're going to do for him, and you tell him, you know, pray and tell him what you want to do for him, and then if he approves Hopefully, he'll approve of what you're doing. You know, you got your plan ready, and, and he'll send you some more help. So we pray prayers like, Lord, make me a better husband. but Make me a better wife. Make me a better father. Make me a better mother. Make me a better employee. Make me a better friend. Make me a better Sunday school teacher. Make me a better preacher. Make me a better this. Make me a better that. Lord, please help me. Please help me. Please help me. I just want to say, for the record, Jesus has no interest in helping you do your life. He just doesn't. Is this the Christian life that Jesus intended for us? Is this the Christian life you've been living? If it is, you're saved, you're forgiven, but if you're, if you, if you're, if you're just trying to get to work and, and you know, Jesus says, let me know when you get stuck, I'll send you some help. If, if that's you, 
God bless you. God have mercy on your soul. Because <laughs> if you live like that, you're going to burn out. You're going to crash and burn. You're going to become bitter and depressed, anxious and defeated, fruitless, joyless, and eventually you're going to give up. And that's the good part. <laughs> Giving up is the good part. Listen, I know this because I lived this. 12 years ago, I crashed and burned. Ten, 12 years ago, I reached the end of my ability to do, to, to try to live this Christian life and please God. And I realized that I had been an abject failure and I thought that he was done with me. I thought that he was rejecting me as a pastor and even as a son. So many well-meaning Christians, sincere Christians live this striving, straining, trying to please God, trying to work for God life while Jesus is over there watching us and we're over here slugging it out, trying to bear fruit, trying to, to be good. And it's, it's exhaust, exhausting for me just to think about that because that is not what God intended. Shoulder to the wheel, nose to the grindstone, I'm going to live this Christian life if it kills me. Well, it will. <laughs> it will. It will kill you. You know, the Lord says in, in Jeremiah 17, 5, Cursed is the one who trusts in man who draws strength from, the mere, fl from mere flesh. Do you know that? You're cursed if you live like that. If that's you... <laughs> Are you tired? Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you exhausted? Are you burdened with guilt and oughts and shoulds and failures and sins and ready to give up? I think a lot of us are. Maybe that's why Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened down, heavy laden, and I will give you more work to do. Let's look at the scripture. I got it up here. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. I think it's on there, David. Come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He wants us to rest, guys. If you're not resting, if you're striving, you're, living, you're not living the Christian life that Christ intended. And that's no condemnation. I want to, Dennis and I just want to take this burden off of you. That's my, that's my whole purpose this morning. So let's go to the next verse. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke implies that you're, you're connected with Jesus in a real way. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find more reward, no, you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest, easy, light, that's the Christian life that Jesus intended for us to live. All right, so Jesus, how does this work? Because I've, I've gotten it wrong. I've been doing it the wrong way. How does this work? Well, I want us to look at a couple of scriptures that Jesus begins to unpack this for his disciples. And you know, he doesn't do this until right before he goes to the cross. This is his last conversation with his disciples. D Dennis looked at a little bit of this last, last time. I want to go back to this very important. You know, in the four Gospels, John is the only one that talks about the gospel that we're talking about. The others are just historical uh, stories about Jesus' life when he was on earth. But John actually brings the gospel into his gospel into his history of Jesus. That's why it's so different than the others. John and Paul got the gospel. And, and John was the disciple or the apostle to the Jews along with Peter, and Paul was to the Gentiles, but they had the same gospel. And so let's look at the gospel according to John here. And I want to go to John 14, verses 16 through 20. So Jesus has just told his disciples that he's leaving. And he says, but don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. Dennis talked about, if you, had, if you haven't heard Dennis's last two messages, phenomenal. Two of the best sermons he's ever preached. He gets better every time he preaches, but go back and listen to those about the Holy Spirit. And by the way, what I'm saying today is not different than what Dennis talked about. 
these sermons dovetail because the Holy Spirit in us is the Spirit of Christ in us. We're one with Christ because the Spirit dwells in us. And Jesus explains this right here. There are two parallel thoughts. I'm going to send you the Spirit, and I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. It's the same thing. It's the Spirit of Christ. Let's, yeah, let's don't parse out the Trinity too much where we understand that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in, are, you know, there's the, there's the three in one, but they are one. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Well, he, it says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 3 that um, the Spirit is the Lord. Well, Jesus is Lord, but the Spirit is Lord. You see what I'm saying? The Spirit of Christ in us is Christ in us, is the Spirit in us. It's the, it's the same. I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and he will give you another helper, advocate, comforter, Jesus, or Jesus, Dennis, they're very similar. Uh, Dennis, unpack that for us. All the different things that this word advocate means to help you and to be with you forever. To be with you. The Holy Spirit is going to come and be with you forever. Wonderful. Let's go to the next verse. The Spirit of truth. Who is the truth? He just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm giving you the spirit of truth. It's his spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. How is that? Jesus was with them, but then he was going to be in them. His spirit was with them. His spirit was going to be in them. Go to the next verse. Here it is. I will not leave you as orphans. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's not going to leave us. You know, let's, let's, let's take this for face value. Jesus didn't go up there to heaven with the Father, and now he's looking down on us, saying, why don't they get it? I told them what to do. I gave them a good example. Why are they blowing it? Because he's not going to leave us as orphans. I will come to you, he says. Verse 19, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's go to the next verse. This is, this is the key verse here. My friend Baxter Kruger says that this is the key verse of the New Testament. On that day, what day? When he sends the Holy Spirit, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Union, oneness. You are in Christ. Christ is in you. You can't get any closer than that. Now, if he lives in you, why would he want you to live your life in your own strength? If the Holy Spirit is the power of Christ and the one who raised Jesus from the dead, and that power lives in you, why would you want to lean on your own strength to live this Christian life? I mean, Jesus just isn't there to watch you a little more closely than he would in heaven. No, that's not the purpose. And so he explains this in the next chapter, chapter 15. Let's go there. He says this to his disciples, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He's the vine dresser. He's the one who fusses over the vine. So I'm the vine and my father is the gardener. He's the, he's the one who works the vine. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 4, remain in me and I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Someone's texting me, so I'm going to take my watch off here. Let's go to the next verse. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> Guys, he means that. He means that. Last verse, verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be, there it is, my disciples. You want to be a disciple? That's how you do it. See, if you go and you look at a grapevine, you can't tell where the vine ends and the branch begins because they're one, they're connected. But what's the source? Which one's the source? This is not a trick question. The vine is the source. It's the one that's in the soil. It's the one that gets the nutrients. It's the one that has the power. The sap flows through the vine into the branches. But where does the branch start? You can't tell. They're one and the same in a sense. There's a source and there's a, an expression of the source, but they're one at the same time. 
And how do, how do branches produce fruit? It's by striving and straining, right? You ever walk by a grapevine and hear this, Ugh! <laughs> I never have. No, the sap runs through the vine into the branch and all of a sudden you see this luscious, large clusters of grapes on these grapevines. And if they've been pruned properly and they've been dealt with by the gardener, they produce beautiful, luscious, abundant fruit. We're branches, guys. We're branches. And apart from him, we can do nothing. So why try? You hear me? Amen. Just hang in there, man. Just, just hang in there with Jesus. Man, this, that's how this is done. So I'll tell you the story. This guy wrote a book, uh, his name is Gil Bill Gillum, and he wrote two books, Lifetime Guarantee, which is about our eternal security, our salvation, and this book called What God Wishes Christians Knew About Christianity. I love that title. And chapter three is only, uh, God wishes Christians knew that only Christ can live the Christian life through us. That's the punchline, by the way, for the sermon. Only Christ can live this Christian life, and he wants to live it through us. Now, here's Bill's story. Bill was a very, he was a type A personality, eight on the Enneagram, if you follow that stuff. He was like a, a hard-hitting, go-getter, successful businessman, and he came to Christ in his 20s, late 20s, and he said, man, Jesus, you are a very lucky Savior because you have me now on your team. And I'm a successful businessman, and I, I do stuff. I produce stuff, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be your best employee. <laughs> I'm going to be the guy that produces more fruit than just about anybody else around here. And so he said, I hit the ground running. I, I, I approached my Christian life just like I approached my successful businesses. And I, I went after it. I taught Sunday school. I did this. I did that. I did the other thing. And he said, I was an abject failure. He said, at the end of every day, I felt like a total loser. And he's like, I couldn't get it. I couldn't understand it. I'm a successful businessman. You know, the bottom line shows that I know what I'm doing and I, I know how to do this. But he said, one of the things that he was failing at was his marriage. He said, I was a, I was, I was a good businessman, but I was super critical and I had a temper that I couldn't control. And that worked pretty good with my employees because I kept them, you know, kept them moving, kept them, you know, producing. But it didn't work well with my sweet wife who is a very tender-hearted, sensitive, loving, caring person that really wanted to please me. But all I could do was get angry with her and criticize her. He said, I treated her that way. I treated my kids that way. And he said, I was losing as a father and a husband. I couldn't, and, I, and, and just... In my Christian life, I couldn't produce what I thought needed to be produced. And the more I tried, the worse it got. <clears throat> and he said, then one day I was reading Paul, Galatians, and I read Galatians 2.20. It says, yeah, there it is. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, all of a sudden, this newsflash came across my heart that I was approaching this thing in the entirely wrong way and that I, I needed to stop. I needed to give up. I needed to raise the, the flag of surrender and say, I can't do this. And neither could Paul. The great apostle to the Gentiles said, stop trying to live this Christian life and let me and, and let Christ live through you, in you and through you. And he said, so I, I realized it. And he said, Lord, I, I'm a horrible husband. I can't control my temper. I'm being a horrible witness to my family. And, and even people that have any kind of view into my life see me as harsh and critical and, and I'm just failing. Would you please take over and live your life through me? And, and he said, now this was the secret for me. He said, I was convinced that the word that the scriptures was God's word to me and that, that what God said he would do, he would do. And he said, just 
faith believing that the scriptures were true and that was all I had, I said, I'm going to start acting like Jesus. You're good for your word. And if I trust you, you'll actually produce this in me. And he said, to my surprise, it worked. I just gave it over to Jesus and he started controlling my temper. I would find myself not getting upset with my wife. Instead of critical words coming out of my mouth, there would be encouraging words. And he said, my marriage started changing. His wife, Annabelle, started, started opening up like a flower. And she was trying to please him as her husband, and she was doing the same thing on her end and failing. And so she talked to him about this. And, you know, how did you change, Bill? And he, he told her, he said, well, I just gave my life over to Jesus and asked him to live his life through me, like Paul said. And he's doing it. He started working. And so she went to the Lord and, and she said, Lord, I want to be a good wife, a good mom. I want to be a good Christian. You know I love you. And he said, Annabelle, I will do it all for you. And I will do it all through you. And so it, it took a little more time than, than it did for Bill. But she gradually began to give her life over and allow Jesus to live his life through her. It was more of a process for Annabelle than it was for Bill. But eventually, she made the great exchange. We talk about the exchange life around here. That's what we're talking about. Exchanging our worn out striving and straining for the life of Jesus. We come to him and rest. We come to him weary and burdened and, and, and we, we take his life and give him ours. What a great exchange. He gets our life and, and we get his. One of my favorite preachers of all time, a guy named Malcolm Smith said this, the biggest day in my life was the day that I realized that I could not live this Christian life. And I stopped trying. I stopped trying. I said, Jesus, only you can live this Christian life. And if I'm ever going to live this life the way it's supposed to be lived, you're going to have to live it through me. And he said, I threw out the idea of ever trying to please God and live this Christian life on my own again. And God has used that man incredibly in the gospel of grace to set people free from striving and straining and just, you know, being one with him. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to go home somewhere and get before the Lord and tell him that you're tired. If you've been living like this, if, you don't, if you've not been experiencing Christ's life in you and through you, I just want you to go find a quiet place and just pour out your heart to him and say that you're done, that you quit, that you give up, you surrender, and just ask him to reveal to you how to live his life through you and give him control. I want to I want to share a journal entry. I want to tell you this is several months ago and um I'm I'm in that gradual process. I'm not like Bill. I just it just didn't happen one day. There there are testimonies of people where instantly they stopped they just gave up and Jesus took over and I could I could give you a list of names of people because I've read all these testimonies of people who in a moment saw it and stopped like Malcolm Smith the biggest day of my life, uh, Jadson Taylor, there came a day in my life, you know, a day. For me, it's been a process. But listen to this. I had just hurt my daughter. I had just done something stupid and hurt Lindsay. And so I, I, I went to the Lord, and this is in my journal. I said, um, my fears get the best of me. My insecurities come out, and I lapse back into the flesh. I'm just being honest. Holy Spirit, deal with me. Father, discipline me. But deal with me in a redemptive way that I may be one in experiential reality with Jesus. That's what we're looking for is the experiential reality of oneness with Christ. Lord, you are one with me because it's already happened, guys. Jesus is already here. Please take over now. Be you through me. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be insecure. I don't want to be curt. I don't want to be short with people. Uh, I don't want to have to have my way and my say, Lord, I'm sick to death of it. 
How do I quit and let you take over my life? That's the question for me. Would you please show me how and do it for me and through me? I want to be no longer I, but Christ. But how? How do I stop and let you start? How do I get out of the way and let you do it all and and live your victorious, obedient, humble life? but whole and holy life through me. I need to know quickly, Lord. I choose to believe that I can trust you and you will answer me and take over. Take me into the rest of faith. Guys, I mean, that, that's just an honest confession. I, that, you know, when we turn to Jesus and we say, Lord, I want to get out of the way and I want you to live through me, He takes us seriously. He answers that prayer. He'll answer that prayer for you. I'm living that more now than I ever have in my life. But I still got a ways to go. And I still have I still find myself in the way. I still find myself doing it. And I have to say, whoa, wait a minute. Lord, I'm trying to do what you're supposed to do. And I step out of the way and let him do it. And when I do that, it works. And when I don't, it doesn't. So would you please go and find a quiet place and say, Lord, I give you my life and I take yours. You're already there. Why don't you go ahead and live through me? Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for sending Jesus. And Jesus, I, 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 I'm so thankful that you didn't just go back to heaven and leave us down here with a bunch of rules and a, and a, and a good example. You, you didn't leave us as orphans. You did come to us. We have realized that you were in the Father and We are in you and you are in us. But Lord, let us live out the experiential reality of union with you and life with you so that we do bear fruit, we do have joy, we do have peace, and we do have the power of you living in us and through us. Lord, I I just pray that you'll do this for every single person in this room and everyone listening online. Lord, I can't imagine what a church would be like filled with people just letting you live your life through us, but I intend to find out. I want that in my own life, and I want that in the lives of every person that's listening to this message. Lord, we just commit this to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.